Men of genius. There are dark patches and there are bright patches. Winston Churchills geni glänste i krigstid, men mellan krigen utkämpade han den ena hopplösa kampen efter den andra. And the public were hostile. They weren't prepared to listen to what he said. They just didn't want to know. If Churchill had died in 1939, what would have been the, the epitaph? There would have been another Lord Randolph. Brilliant beginning, flickering out, and then failure. Indien, det brittiska imperiets juvel, skakades under 1930-talet av demonstrationer för oberoende. Churchill hade som ung soldat försvarat Indiens gränser. Men när den brittiska regeringen erbjöd nationalisterna begränsat självstyre angrep han deras ledare Gandhi och kallade honom för upprorisk advokat och halvnaken fakir. The of India bill only gave the Indians a very modest degree of self-government. But as far as Churchill was concerned, of course, it gave them much too much. And his ignorance on the subject was monumental. He had emphatic views that his father had, that the British rule in India was wholly benevolent and that nothing should be done to disturb it. Things are going from bad to worse. Great mismanagement and weakness are causing unrest and disturbance to 300 million primitive people whose well-being is in our care. Men Churchill fick bara med sig en liten skara reaktionärer. Han framstod som gammaldags och opolitlig och som ett hot mot de konservativas ledare Stanley Baldwin. Out of the Indian campaign, Winston lost a lot of credit with his own party, particularly after we'd, we'd forfeited a couple of by-elections. Ett ägde rum i Wavertree i Liverpool. Här ställde sonen Randolph upp som oberoende kandidat i opposition mot regeringens indienpolitik. Churchill stödde Randolph, men företaget skadade de båda. He came away with 10,000 votes, which in the space of 10 days wasn't uh, discreditable. The only trouble was he split the Tory vote and let the socialist in. And that was something that the Tory party machine never forgave him for. Randolph had to take help of his sisters, Diana and Sarah. We all traveled down the train together, leaving Randolph to finish off the election. And I remember the girl saying to me on the train, if only father was more like Randolph. Uh, when father is going to make a speech, the whole household is absolutely hushed and uh, uh, on standby. Atmosphere very tense. Whereas Randolph, everything comes naturally to him. He doesn't prepare a speech, it just comes like that. In a sense, Randolph had talents which Winston didn't have. Inklusive en förmåga att genera sin egen far. När Churchill ställde upp i valet 1935 blev sonen som också försökte bli vald en black on foten. Randolph was standing on a sort of independent, arrogant and almost anti-Baldwin conservative ticket. So father and son quarreled then and father said to son, look, don't make things more difficult for me because I'm expecting the call. And like many uh, a young minister before and since, He, the rather senior minister by then, sat by his telephone waiting and the call never came. Churchill blev allt mer isolerad inom sitt eget parti. People like my parents, who were backward Tories, 
never trusted Churchill for a minute. They thought he was an adventurer. It's part of the relationship between Churchill and the Tory party. They didn't see him as one of themselves. There was this invaluable streak of, some would say, ruthlessness, some would say vulgarity, but it was different from the ordinary run of English gentlemen turned into politicians. Men han levde som godsherre på Chartwell. Godset var hans fästning, hans tillflyktsort, hans arbetsplats. Här författade han sina välbetalda böcker och tidningsartiklar och fungerade som hela hushållets medelpunkt. Men hushållet förändrades i takt med att barnen flyttade därifrån. Diana, som var den äldsta och blygaste, gifte sig 1932. The wedding proved to be the most popular in London this season. The departure of the bride and bridegroom presented an amazing scene, for in seeking to avoid the multitude at the end of the central pathway, they retraced their steps to a side one. Det äktenskapet sprack. Men Diana gifte snart om sig. Den här gången med en konservativ politiker på uppåtgående, Duncan Sands. Och systern Sarah, som visat framfötterna som amatörskådespelare på Chartwell, valde teaterscenen. Där förälskade hon sig i komikern Vic Oliver som var 18 år äldre. Hon gifte sig med honom trots föräldrarnas motstånd. What were you going to tell me? Listen, Ruth, I've got a grand idea. Uh huh. What is it? Well, I, I can't explain to you while I'm dancing. Let's go to your house and I'll tell you all about it. Oh, well, I don't think we can go home. You see my family. Well, what's the matter with them? Oh, well, nothing. Any. It'll be a bit of a change from all this. Oh, don't you worry. I've been thrown out of better homes than yours. Come on. Randolph fick i uppdrag att förhindra bröllopet, men de gifte sig i alla fall. Också det äktenskapet sprack. Men Winston och Clemmy höll ihop, även om de ofta var ifrån varann. Clemmy for bland annat på långa semestrar i tropikerna. My darling, my thoughts are with you nearly all the time. And though basking in lovely sunshine and blue seas, I miss you and home terribly. Tender love, Clemmy. Churchill hälsade ofta på hos goda vänner i Sydfrankrike. Ibland i sällskap med Randolph. My mother never really took to South of France society. She was always terrified that my father would would gamble in the casino. Um, he loved gambling, and he did gamble, and he lost on and off quite a bit of money. My mother was in the South of France with him on one occasion, and my father had gone off, much to her disgust, to the casino, where he was on a winning streak and when she woke up in the morning she felt a sort of crinkly crunk, crunchy feeling and when he came back he'd covered her entirely like the birds of the forest covered the sleeping children with banknotes <laughs> men ekonomin plågade klemmi för Chartwell kostade och Winston var extravagant. Trots sina stora inkomster var han ständigt skuldsatt och frågan diskuterades ofta inom familjen. At luncheon they debated what they were going to um, cut down on must save expenses. Well it ended up that Winston and Diana must stop smoking at first economy. And they didn't decide anything else. That was the end of it. I suppose he always had this feeling within him that he he was like a silkworm. He would just reel out more spools of silk. Den största inkomstkällan blev Churchills biografi över anfaden, den första härtigen av Marlborough. 
Han tog de bästa forskarna till hjälp, men han struntade i om hans tider passade dem. I was teaching history in Oxford. I would get messages saying, expect you tomorrow. And if you said, well, you see, sir, I can't come because I'm lecturing, he would say, you know, it's a very, very bad line. I can't hear a word you're saying, so you come tomorrow. Churchill levde sig in i Marlboros stora fälttåg. He moved without noticing, really, from the past to the present and back again. Marlborough never fought a battle that he did not win, nor besieged a fortress that he did not take. He held a grand alliance together, no less by his diplomacy than by his victories. He preserved by his genius the liberties of England and of Europe against tyranny. It's a classic example of aristocratic ancestor worship. Part of Churchill's motive in doing that is to rehabilitate him from the Victorian view that he was an adventurer, that he was unprincipled, that he liked power and liked money. Another thing that he's doing, by implication, of course, is to defend himself, that is Churchill, from similar attacks about him. Men studiet av Marlborough gav också Churchill viktiga strategiska kunskaper för framtiden. It was a continuous thread right through his interpretation of British history that Britain could not fight a European war alone. There would always have to be allies. I början av 1930-talet grubblade Churchill på krigsrisken i Europa ifall nazisterna skulle komma till makten i Tyskland. Sonen Randolph, som nu var journalist, hade redan rapporterat om det hot som Hitler representerade. My father was alongside him traveling in his trimotor Ford plane for the election campaign that was underway in Germany. And uh, he witnessed Hitler's arrival in the stadium and uh, all the Nazi stormtroopers doing their Sieg Heil. And it was in the course of those articles that quite categorically my father, and he was the first person in public life to do this, stated the rise to power of Hitler in Germany means war inevitably between Britain and Germany. Winston Churchill spann vidare på temat och menade att Tysklands olagliga upprustning snart skulle göra landet jämstarkt med England. Regeringen måste omedelbart öka försvarsutgifterna för att möta det hotet. There är en nation which with all its strength and virtue is in the grip of a group of ruthless men preaching a gospel of intolerance and racial pride. Now they are rearming with the utmost speed. And ready to their hands is this new lamentable weapon of the air before which women and children, the weak and frail, the warrior and the civilian, the frontline trenches and the cottage home, all lie in equal and impartial peril. På Churchill mottog Churchill en ström av besökare som gav honom hemlig information om Englands svaghet och Tysklands växande ambitioner. Han frågade också ut Clemens kusin Diana Mosley som kände Hitler väl. I was invited to luncheon by the Churchills because he wanted to hear about Hitler. And I said you must meet him. You it would fascinate you. You certainly should go there. Oh no, he said he'd already made his mind up. There was to be no question. Även i muntrare stunder upptog nazihotet hans tankar. He'd been given the black swans, which he took enormous pleasure in. But once a year, Emden geese would fly over and land on the lake. And one year, they arrived in the middle of lunch. And there was a roar, because Winston would face the window so he could see out. He would say, the Nazis have arrived. And I think there were some guests there, and we were all ordered to take up our pitchforks or knives and things and rush down the garden in the middle of lunch. I mean, everything was interrupted to drive off the Nazis. 
Nazisterna verkade bli en fix idé hos honom och återigen stötte Churchills hårda retorik bort många som annars skulle ha lyssnat på honom. Det really debased the language of alarmism by depicting Gandhi for example as such an evil sinister figure when it came to then describing Hitler or Mussolini uh, who were genuinely sinister particularly Hitler um, people weren't, didn't believe him Sen kom det första tecknet på att Churchill kanske hade rätt Hitler invaderade renlandet och bröt där med mot internationella avtal inom det egna partiet började man lyssna på Churchill Pavilion at Bournemouth, scene of a national conservative annual conference. The Tories are concerned about the state of Britain's defences and show their sympathy with the views of Mr. Winston Churchill, one of the chief advocates of increasing the armed forces of the Crown. Here seen with his son Randolph. Churchill fick regeringen och finansminister Neville Chamberlain att lova högre försvarsutgifter. And to see the gaps in our defences filled at the earliest possible moment. Även om budskapet om upprustning började accepteras gällde det inte budbäraren. När Chamberlain blev premiärminister 1937 gav inte heller han Churchill en plats i regeringen. De båda bedömde också nazisternas hot om att invadera Tjeckoslovakien på olika sätt. Krig tycktes nära förestående och folk var oroliga så Chamberlain valde att flyga till Hitler för att förhandla om en delning av Tjeckoslovakien. Münchenavtalet välkomnades i England eftersom det bevarade freden. Men för Churchill så var det inget annat än ett stort nederlag. När Hitler gick in i den tysktalande delen av Tjeckoslovakien kritiserade Churchill de politiska ledare som valt att offra en liten nation. Aldrig hade Churchills politiska aktier stått så lågt i kurs. Han hade också ekonomiska problem med stora skulder och fick sluta med sin viktigaste tidningskrönika på grund av sina obekväma åsikter. Churchill hade kanske sålt som man inte hade fått hjälp av en god vän. Och ledande partivänner som Lord Halifax som förespråkade en eftergiftspolitik uppfattade Churchill som ett hinder för freden. People such as Lord Halifax's foreign secretary took the view that Winston was imperiling the possibility of his improving on any understanding with Hitler because Hitler resented Winston and made it very clear that he resented him. De konservativa försökte till och med beröva Churchill hans plats i parlamentet. The party as a whole felt enough was enough. That, that, that they'd had enough of him. And all sorts of rumors began to circulate, including rumors about his private life and his drinking. And we now know from the archives that these came from even as high as conservative central office. Central office uh, was, in fact, trying to persuade the local association that um, Churchill must at least be silenced. I think they'd have been happy with that, not with deselection necessarily. Churchill överlevde en omröstning med bara sex röster men avvisade varje förslag om att han skulle överge den aktiva politiken och dra sig tillbaka. När tyskarna ockuperade Prag visade sig Churchill få rätt. Hitler kunde inte stoppas med eftergiftspolitik. En kampanj för att få in Churchill i regeringen inleddes med stöd av flera ledande dagstidningar. Men Chamberlain fortsatte att hålla honom utanför trots påtryckningarna. I september 1939 invaderade sedan Hitler Polen. England kunde inte längre undvika ett krig med Tyskland. Och Churchill kunde inte längre hållas utanför regeringen utan utsågs till marinminister. 
Efter många års isolering blev Churchill nu den mest inflytelserika och synliga medlemmen av regeringen. The first lord of the admiralty is very much the guest of honor at his son's wedding. And here comes the bride, the honorable Pamela Digby, age 19. The bridegroom, Mr. Randolph Churchill, is with his regiment. So it's swords and smiles. And the bride is having quite a lot of trouble with that feather. Randolph hade bråttom att gifta sig med Pamela Digby. Han hade uppvaktat henne i bara två veckor. Han var fast besluten att säkra familjens fortbestånd innan kriget började. Och det kunde inte börja snart nog för Winston. Han ville skicka en styrka för att hindra tyskarna från att ta Norge. Men fienden han före och hela företaget blev ett dyrbart misslyckande. Parlamentet la skulden för nederlaget i Norge på Chamberlain, inte på Churchill. Under den politiska kris som följde föreslog Chamberlain att en koalitionsregering skulle bildas men Labourpartiet hade inte förtroende för honom. Eftersom Lord Halifax inte ville ta över blev det Churchill som fick axla ansvaret. He did appear to be a man who knew about how to fight a war. Uh, he knew about grand strategy. He wanted to defeat Hitler. He was a man who had seen earlier than most that Hitler was evil. So in many ways he was better qualified for the job, even though at the same time there were many people who were really horrified at the thought of this wayward and unstable man taking over. Goodbye, Mr. Chamberlain, and thanks for all you've tried to do. We welcome the new Prime Minister, Mr. Churchill. He always realized that there was some great destiny awaiting him in the future. And it always looked as if it was about to happen, and it never did. And then finally, but finally, in 1940, the uh, moment of destiny came. And the... Uh... Nazis look out tonight from their blatant, clattering, panoplied Germany. They cannot find one single friendly eye in the whole circumference of the globe. Not one. I maj 1940 evakuerades den brittiska expeditionskåren från Dunkirk där den blivit inringad av de framryckande tyskarna. Churchill hade varit premiärminister i mindre än tre veckor. Storbritannien stod ensamt och Churchill hade inget annat än trotsiga ord att ta till mot fienden. We shall fight in France. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. Churchill represented the feelings of the overwhelming mass of the British people then better than anybody else and he put it in magnificent language. He had one astonishing quality, and that was um, to ar arouse instinctive and immediate enthusiasm. He never actually saw people at all. I mean, he never took a bus in his life. He would have a car, which would be chauffeur-driven, but he had the instincts of people en masse. An imagination was now fully possible. It was pretty obvious that uh, if Hitler had invaded England, the first people to disappear would be the Churchills. And he uh, told us in all seriousness that uh, if the Germans land, um, then uh, if you only have the kitchen knife, use it. And if you account for one German, that we, you've done your duty. Trots sin iver att gå på offensiven försummade Churchill inte försvaret. 
Han flyttade sitt högkvarter till ett skyddsrum vid Storys Gate nära Downing Street. Här gjorde han sig redo för krig och drillade sin armé av assistenter och sekreterare för att få dem att anpassa sig till hans mycket speciella arbetsvanor. He worked almost 24 hours a day with one or two catnaps in between. That terrifying little telephone bell would go a few minutes after eight when the day began. One might work up all day um, take it in turns of having more of us to share the task during the day um, until evening time, quick lunch, evening meal, and then two of us, or possibly three, would be on duty after dinner, and he would restart the day almost, I mean, just start working anew. He's always maintained, you know, that this afternoon nap was crucial. Well, it was very awkward for other people because nobody else could have a nap. But it was an example of saying, I'm a man who everything is subordinate to my requirements. He came down to the office about half past 11, and then I heard, uh, <coughs> and then he started. And off he went. And the words flowed out. And I wrote and wrote. And after a long time, he turned round on me and he said, are you tired? And I said, no, no, I'm not tired. And he said, We must go on and on like the gun horses till we drop. Churchill tyckte om att befinna sig i händelsernas centrum. Och när slaget om Storbritannien nådde sin kulmen tog han med sig sin svärdotter Pamela till jaktflyget stridsledningscentral för att följa hur kriget utvecklades. It was very frightening because You saw the wave of the Luftwaffe coming over. You saw the air squadrons going up to meet them, the intense battle that took place. You saw gradually all these bulbs which indicated the aircraft base going dark. They went dark when there was no more aircraft to come up. And suddenly they were all dark. If the Luftwaffe had spent another wave of bombers across to England at that moment, there was no aircraft left to go up and intercept them. Winston sat there and it was as if he'd personally rebuffed the German bombers. Churchills mod smittade av sig på andra i takt med att den tyska blitzen intensifierades. At the height of the, the bombing in London, when I was with Winston, I had no fear at all. And I was convinced that nothing could possibly happen. He would walk through the streets, he would go up to the roof at Dining Street in order to look what he called the fireworks. Directly I left his presence, then i got a little bit frightened and would die for shelter. Under stor mediebevakning gjorde premiärministern det ena besöket efter det andra i de städer som blivit bombade. Hans närvaro hjälpte till att hålla landets moral uppe. Clemmy följde ofta med. Resten av familjen hade också mobiliserats. Sarah arbetade med fotospaning och Mary vid ett luftvärnsbatteri. My papa was touchingly thrilled in the slow upward rise of his soldier daughter. And um, when my battery was in London, in Hyde Park, somebody who was dining with him one night said, your father suddenly said, ooh, there's an air raid, let's go and watch Mary's battery in action. Whereupon he leapt into the, the car and came to the battery and sat puffing a cigar under a large notice saying no smoking, which embarrassed me appallingly. But nobody else seemed to mind very much. 
Även tyskelyssner Randolph sökte sig till fronten och blev stationerad i Egypten där han tjänstgjorde vid ett ökenförband. Hemma födde hans hustru Pamela en son som fick sin farfars namn Winston. I knew it was very important for Winston to have a grandson and he caused came up and saw it at every possible moment and I remember him looking at the child and saying poor poor kitten poor kitten a terrible t- world to be born into Han hade verkligen skäl att vara nedslagen i Nordafrika hade Rommel drivit tillbaka de brittiska styrkorna efter deras inledande framgångar. I månader hade det brittiska imperiet kämpat ensamt samtidigt som Hitler och hans allierade utsträckt sitt tyranni. It is upon this foundation that Hitler with his tattered lackey Mussolini at his tail and Admiral Dahlow frisking at his side pretends to build out of hatred, appetite and racial assertion a new order for Europe. Nästa offer för Hitlers nya världsordning var Sovjetunionen, men de tyska arméernas framryckning gjorde att Churchill fick en allierad i kampen mot Hitler. So now this bloodthirsty gutter snipe must launch his mechanized armies upon new fields of slaughter, pillage and devastation. Any man or state who fights against Nazism will have our aid. It follows therefore that we shall give whatever help we can to Russia and to the Russian people. Clementine stödde personligen kampanjen för att rädda Ryssland. The people of Russia have set up a new standard of courage and of endurance in the terrible sufferings through which they are going. In my humble way, I will do all I can. And I wish to repeat that I am proud to have been invited by the Red Cross in St. John to help them in this appeal. Rysslands hjälpen sysselsatte Klemmi under en stor del av kriget och kampanjen hjälpte till att stärka alliansen med Sovjet. Men det var USA som Churchill ville få med på sin sida. Som en vänskaplig gest hade president Roosevelt skickat sin nära medarbetare Harry Hopkins och det speciella sändebudet Avril Harriman till England. Men Roosevelts handlingsfrihet begränsades av den allmänna opinionen i USA som inte ville ha krig. I en hemlig brevväxling som pågått sedan 1939 bönade Churchill om hjälp. Secret and personal president Roosevelt from former naval person. I trust you realize Mr president that the voice and force of the United States may count for nothing. If they are withheld too long, they have a completely subjugated, nazified Europe established with astonishing swiftness, and the weight may be more than we can bear. We must ask, therefore, as a matter of life and death, to be reinforced with these destroyers. When negotiations began to try to claw out of the Americans some military help and 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 some destroyers and some ammunition. The Americans made it very difficult. They made every stage of the negotiation difficult. And Churchill became very frustrated and personally very bitter. Men Churchill hade en diplomatisk framgång. I augusti 1941 fick han till stånd ett hemligt möte med presidenten utanför Newfoundland. Churchill hade höga förväntningar inför mötet. Det beskrevs som harmoniskt, men enigheten var mest symbolisk. Psychologically, I think it made people think in terms of us together. It was a very, very excellent uh, PR move, especially on, on Churchill's part. 
USA visade fortfarande inga tecken på att vilja gå med i kriget. Men på landstället Checkers kvällen den 7 december 1941 förändrades allting. Familjen Churchill åt middag med den nye USA-ambassadören Gil Wynant och det speciella sänderbudet Avril Harriman med dottern Kathleen. The war was not going well and a lot of the time he sat and I was sitting next to him with his head in his hands. At 9 o'clock Sawyer's his butler came in with this little radio with a flip top and we listened to the news and it wasn't till towards the end of the news that suddenly there was an interruption saying there's been word of the bombing of and nobody quite got it in fact uh, Tommy Thompson the naval aide who was at dinner said Pearl River but Avril Harriman said no I think it was Pearl Harbor and at that moment one of the secretaries came in to say that the Admiralty had confirmed that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed. So Winston, accompanied by Harriman and Wynant, went out of the room saying, I must immediately uh, place a call to President Roosevelt. And I gather that in that conversation he said, we are now both in this together. And I will go to the House of Commons on Monday and declare war on Japan. För första gången under kriget visste Churchill att han nu satt med en vinnande hand. Fullt övertygad om den slutliga segen kom Churchill till Washington inom tre veckor efter Pearl Harbor. Tyskland hade förklarat USA krig och de allierade måste lägga upp strategin. Och Churchills personlighet gjorde intryck på moderns hemland. Uh, I cannot help but reflecting that if my father had been uh, American and my mother British <coughs> instead of the other way around, uh, I might have got here on my own. <laughs> Men det fanns spänningar bakom skämtsamheterna. Oh, oh, no. When Churchill came to the White House, everything was turned upside down. It was mostly a shock to my grandmother. He tended to sleep in in the mornings. Uh, he tended not to go to bed till very late. He had a nap every afternoon, and FDR never had a nap. Uh, and, uh, and then would sit up with Churchill late at night. And she saw the toll this was uh, taking uh, on, on FDR. But FDR enjoyed it. He enjoyed it very much. And in fact, I think it really is part of that rapport. They didn't sit up doing policy. They were sitting up telling stories and exchanging uh, things. But at the same time, woven in and out of the jokes were perceptions of how policy would proceed. Och om hur kriget skulle föras. USA ville öppna en andra front mot Hitler i Nordeuropa. Men Churchill övertalade Roosevelt om att välja Medelhavet och en gemensam invasion av Nordafrika, trots den amerikanska militärens betänkligheter. Vi knew he was a canny, wily devil, a manipulator. He was the first to admit that himself. We knew about his faults, but he, there was still something about him. Um, what he had stood for, uh, it touched us. He could uh, pull out uh, humor, pathos. He was a terrifically persuasive fellow. Churchills stora övertalningsförmåga utsattes för ett svårt prov när han och Avril Harriman reste till Moskva för att informera Stalin om att det inte skulle bli en andra front i Frankrike under 1942. Ryssarna hade krävt en invasion i Europa för att lätta på det intensiva tryck som de utsattes för. Stalin blev rasande och anklagade Churchill för feghet, men han svarade sammanbitet. He was annoyed and he lost his temper and he started talking about 
Britain and himself and what they'd done during the war. And his poor interpreter, Major Burse, just gave up trying to keep out with this torrent of words. And Stalin said through his interpreter, it's not necessary. I know what he said. Från Moskva reste Churchill direkt till Nordafrika för att rådgöra med sina generaler. Britterna hade lidit svåra förluster i ökenkriget mot Rommel. Det var dags att möblera om i militärledningen och börja om på ny kula. Churchill var uh, extremt tuff med... Uh, uh, with those who commanded in, in the desert. There's no doubt about it. He was ruthless, and rightly ruthless, with lack of drive, uh, lack of oomph in the desert war. He gave General Montgomery the orders for the whole operation. And then he took it to him with what he was the best at, to raise morale among the soldiers. I oktober avancerade britternas åttonde armé genom öknen och besegrade Rommel vid El Alamein. Därmed så öppnades hela den nordafrikanska kusten. Det var den första större brittiska segen i kriget och den sista som de skulle vinna på egen hand. Men det var den segen Churchill hade väntat på och ögonblicket fick honom att jubla. Ah, this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end. Uh, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Later during this visit, we were in there a few days, he said I want to sail round the harbor which was full of um, ships that had been sunk. So I remember getting in this small boat with him and we were going in and out of the ships which was just below the water or just sticking up in odd angles and he loved it. It appealed to him enormously. Churchill njöt av krigets drama och detaljer. Under planeringen av invasionen i Italien och senare Frankrike hade han synpunkter på varenda operation. Det frästade hårt på militärledningen. Den största bördan föll på Sir Alan Brooke. Alan Brooke was constantly irritated by Churchill. A lot of Alan Brooke's time was spent dissuading from Churchill from undertaking operations which he could see would fail or were pointless or or a waste of resources. He never faces realities. At one moment we are reducing our forces and the next we are invading the continent with vast armies for which there is no hope of ever finding the shipping. He is quite incorrigible and I am quite exhausted. Hans bristande insikter retade emellanåt de yngre officerarna som deltog aktivt i striderna. He did talk a lot of rot about the strategic aspect. For example, he described Italy as a soft underbelly of Europe. In fact, it was a very spiky spine because the fighting there was probably the uh, most exhausting of any campaign in the war. So we didn't really, in that sense, trust his judgment. One can depict Churchill as an infuriating military amateur, blundering around and upsetting people unnecessarily. Or you can take another view and say that he was the essential goad, the risk taker, recognizing that in war you have to take risks. The war itself is a gamble. Men när allt kom omkring gick Churchill aldrig emot sina generaler. Och nu måste han böja sig för sina amerikanska allierade. Med sina större resurser tog de i allt högre grad över planeringen och själva krigföringen. De allierade träffade Stalin första gången i Teheran 1943. De tre stora diskuterade strategi men lurpassade samtidigt på varann på stormakters vis. Den nära relationen mellan Churchill och Roosevelt höll på att förändras. President Roosevelt 
uh, got it into his head uh, that uh, he and he alone could deal with Stalin. And so at the Tehran conference, he publicly rather made up to Stalin and rather snubbed Winston Churchill. At uh, dinner, Stalin made a proposal or a toast that the first thing that the Allies should do after victory was to line up 50,000 top-ranking German officers and shoot them all. Well, of course, that uh, violated Churchill's sense of right, and he got terribly upset. Roosevelt chimed in. But he chimed in trying to make a joke, but he said, oh, well, let's, let's reduce it to 49,000. Churchill, angry, goes out in the next room and won't rejoin the dinner until Stalin himself went out and reassured him that he was only joking. There I sat with the great Russian bear on one side of me and on the other side, the great American buffalo. And between the two sat the poor little English donkey who was the only one who knew the right way home. In 1943 fyllde Churchill 70. Hans döttrar oroade sig för den påfrestning som de ständiga resorna innebar och höll ett vakande öga över honom under hela kriget. Han drabbades av oregelbunden hjärtverksamhet och fick sedan lunginflammation. He was working far too hard and far too many hours per day. He used to smoke excessively cigars and um, he was very ill in Carthage. He had pneumonia. You know, I had my doubts whether he was going to recover. Yesterday morning, just before my arrival, because he felt well again, he was as happy as a lark and began to smoke again, which of course is wrong. He's gaining strength every day, but very slowly indeed. Bara några dagar efter tillfrisknandet hade han återtagit befälet över krigsplanläggningen. Sarah och sonen Randolph var hos honom. Randolph uh, came out. Uh, he wanted to fight. Uh, he was very, uh, very courageous, and uh, he so he, he got himself attached to a to an armored regiment. But when it uh, there wasn't uh, uh, any fighting, he came back and uh, was rather a nuisance. If you were coming to one of our conferences, my heart sank because he always seemed to upset his father over something. And they were very uh, close, and, uh, but just they didn't work together. The sort of thing that Randolph did uh, was to tell his father uh, how to reshuffle his government or to get rid of him and put him in his place. It got to the point where uh, they would have such humdingers of rows that my grandmother uh, banned my father at one stage from 10 Downing Street during the war because she was frightened that it would give my grandfather a heart attack. Eftersom han undvek honom på Downing Street sökte sig Randolph till Jugoslavien. De kommunistiska partisanerna hade hållit stånd mot tyskarna i bergen. Randolph skulle ansluta sig till en brittisk militär enhet och hoppade fallskärm för att komma dit. Att Churchills son infann sig imponerade på partisanledaren Tito men orsakade problem för Randolphs egen överordnade brigadgeneral Fitzroy MacLean. Churchill had said to me you can have anybody in the British Army, Navy or Air Force you want. And I picked what I think was a, a wonderful team. It didn't stop Randolph saying to me, I'm sorry to have to tell you, Brigadier, that your other officers uh, are neither my social nor my intellectual equals. I thought this was in the middle of a German offensive. Everything was going wrong. And I thought how absolutely intolerable. But I said, uh, thank you for telling me that, uh, Randolph. I can't do anything about it now at this moment, but I bear it in mind. De allierade var nu på offensiven överallt. Från sitt brofäste i Normandie anföll de amerikanska och brittiska arméerna, de tyska styrkorna 
över hela Frankrike. Churchill for till Hjalta för det sista gemensamma mötet med Stalin och Roosevelt. Han visste att krigslutet inte var långt borta, men nu hade han sämre kort på hand. Churchill probably went to Yalta in an optimistic frame of mind, but he became depressed during the course of the conference. It became obvious to him that uh, it wasn't now a big three, it was a big two and a half. He was the half. He saw Roosevelt and Stalin agreeing on things which Churchill felt inimical to British interests or inimical to the vision of the world which he wanted. And that, that pained him greatly, I think. Stalin gav inte med sig. Det territorium Röda armén hade intagit, det skulle ryssarna ha ett dominerande inflytande över. Roosevelt orkade inte stå emot. Han hade bara två månader kvar att leva. Churchill var full av onda aningar. I don't think he had many illusions and he used to say at times in committee we shall end with the barbarians in the heart of Europe, which was exactly what we did. Men ännu så länge höll alliansen med ryssarna och Churchill gjorde sina arméer sällskap in i det ruinlandskap som återstod av Hitlers rike. Han hade uppnått sitt främsta mål, seger, kosta vad det ville. Segen stod nu för dörren, kostnaderna återstod än att summera. <skratt>